Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called A Night to Forget. Excuse me. It's dark in here. Find the doggone lights. Where's the lights? There aren't any lights, John H. Who's that? It's me. What'd you say about the lights? I said there aren't any lights. There's got to be. Not in here, John H. Who's in this Studio 15? You kidding? This is the morgue. That was last night. I think it was a dream. I remember I went to bed early because I had to get up so early this morning to get that stuff to Ted before he takes off for California. I, I drank a bottle of ginger ale with some lemon juice. I read Variety for about 15 minutes. Then I went to sleep. Must have been uh, no later than 10.30. Then this happened. I... You know how it is sometimes when you get in a dream and you don't think you're dreaming, and when you wake up, you wonder whether it happened or not? Well, I was walking down the hall to Studio 15 for this broadcast, and when I went in, it was all dark. And I stumbled around trying to find the lights, and I hit my shin on something, and then this voice in the dark talked to me. You kidding? This is the morgue. I mean... I'll be darned if I can figure it out. I think it was a dream, all right. But my shin hurts where I barked it. And it's all black and blue. I woke up and I lay there quite a while. You know, half dopey, trying to figure it out. I turned the lights on finally and I was right there in my room with my shin hurting me. I know I hadn't been out of bed because I was all wound up in the covers. And I I couldn't get back to sleep again. You know how it is? You have a nightmare and you're afraid to go back to sleep because you might have another one, uh, a worse one. Well, listen. I was just lying there in my own room with the lights on, looking at the ceiling and trying to think. And it began to get dark. No, the, the lights didn't go out. I could see the lights, but it was dark. Everything just sort of uh, faded, like in a movie, you know? And pretty soon it was black dark. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. And I just, I just lay there, flat on my back, in the dark and the silence, and I was scared. Doesn't he look nice? Beautiful. He's got that blue and white shirt on that I gave him. I wish I could have got that tie from him in time. I always liked that tie. It is pretty. He certainly looks nice. Certainly does. Look, will you two please get out of my room? What you say, John H.? I, I said get out of my room. Why, this isn't your room, John H. Now, look. Uh... Of course it isn't. Now, look, if I have to get up and chase you out of here. Right, John H. You know you can't get off. Of course you can't. You're dead, John H. And then it, it got, well, undark. And pretty soon it was just the same as it was before I, I fell asleep. If I did fall asleep. Look, I'm a, I'm a hard-headed guy, even if I do work on super... Uh, 
supernatural radio shows. You don't want to believe this stuff. You go nutty. Only, well, sometimes... I always sleep in pajamas. Both halves. I put on my pajamas when I went to bed last night. Red and white striped textron. Yeah. Well, when I woke up, or when it got undark again, I was wearing a blue and white shirt I never saw in my life. And I was wearing a hand-painted Countess Mara necktie that I never saw before either. So this is too good. Somebody's playing funny jokes on me. I love practical jokers. In a pig's eye, I do. Radio's full of practical jokers. All sorts of bum gags, like Don Amici used to do when he was a radio actor. You used to be reading a commercial, giving it this or that. Or. Don would come up behind you and start to take your coat off. Well, you know you can't stop. You're on the air and you have to make with this thing. So you'd wiggle around. The first thing, you'd have your coat. Then he'd unbutton your suspender buttons. Take off your necktie. You can't do a thing but keep that old smile in your voice and go about locked in goodness and please, Mrs. Housewife, buy the large economy size and holding onto your pants with one hand and it's all very, very funny. Especially if the sponsor's sitting there in the booth looking at you. So I say to myself, some practical joker. Only I add a couple of adjectives to that. Only thing is, how did he get the lights to go out? I I lie there a while, and I think, and I try to figure it out. And I, I shut my eyes, I guess. Anyway, when I opened them, it was dark again. I am walking around in the dark, and the ground is, is springy underfoot. There's a cool wind blowing. What are those things? Those, those white things. Why, they look like gravestones. They are gravestones. Will you stand to one side, please, Johnny? Uh, excuse me. I gotta get to work, see? This is an extra special rush job. I gotta get it done right away. Uh, uh, uh did you say something, Johnny? Uh, I was just gonna ask you, what is this place? My goodness, John H., this is a cemetery. Cemetery? Certainly. Would you move your foot a little? What am I doing in a cemetery? What do people usually do in a cemetery, John H.? Why, why, what are, what are you doing? Me? I'm just chiseling your name on this gravestone. there it was, laid out in chalk on the gravestone. John H. And I shut my eyes. When I opened up again, I was, I was lying on my bed. I, well, you know what people mean when they say their, their mind reels. Oh, boy, I do. I rubbed my eyes and I felt like sand on my fingers. It wasn't sand, though. It was marble dust. Brother, I was shivering. This kind of nightmare is a little too real. And the telephone rang. And so I got up to answer it. Mind you, I was awake. Well, I know I was. Well, the lights were on. I got up and I picked up the receiver. And I said, Hello? Hello? Sure is too bad, isn't it? Sure is. I never heard of such a thing. Hello. Hello. Poor old John H. This is John H. Hello. Poor old L, I'd say. It's tougher on him than on John H. L? L who? L April. You know, the sound effects man. Oh, I didn't know his name. Who is this? Hello. Yes, he feels pretty awful about it. Well, I should think he was. Who is? Killing a man. He didn't mean to, you dope. I know it, but just the same. Poor old John H. He didn't know it was loaded. I mean, loaded with bullets. Matter of fact, there was just the one bullet. One was 
Right now? Right on the air, too. Yeah. I bet that was the first time a radio audience ever heard a real killing. <laughs> yeah. Hello. I want to know who this is. Uh, what about his commercials? You know? John H., you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm auditioning for the big one tomorrow. You are? Yeah, they called me this morning. Gee, I wonder if I could get in on that. Well, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they're going to pick me. I think I'll try anyway. Sure you won't mind? No. Oh, no. Well, I'll see you. Uh, poor old John H. Yeah, too bad, wasn't it? So long. Who is that? Hello? Hello, hello. Yes, sir? You got me in on a crossed wire or something. Oh, no, sir. Well, when you rang me, I picked up the phone well, and... I'm sorry, sir, but I didn't ring you. What? Well, I hadn't had a call for you all the... Now, that wasn't a nightmare. Or a dream. That happened. Even if the operator did say she didn't ring me. Whoever it was playing a joke on me, they fixed it with the operator so she'd say that. Didn't they? All right, that's the way I figured it, too. So, this was about 11.30. At half past 12, the manager of the hotel called me on the phone. I hate to wake you up at this hour of the night, John H., but I thought maybe Radio Registry or somebody might have called you and couldn't get you, see? And I know how important it is for people on the radio to get their calls. What are you talking about? I I just thought you might want to call Registry and see if they've been trying to get you, see? I don't get it. Oh, excuse me. See, uh, something happened to our telephones about 10 o'clock, and nobody's been able to get a call in or out of the hotel since then, and I... Jokers might have got to the manager, too. But this morning when I came downstairs, I, I found he wasn't kidding. The phones had been out for two hours and a half. Well, something blew up in the switchboard or something. Well, that's carrying a practical joke an awful long ways, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's one night I won't forget, believe me. Yeah, but I gotta stop this kind of talk. And yeah, this kind of thinking. Yeah, I will forget it. Heck, it was probably a lot of nightmares. I'm going to stop drinking ginger ale before I go to bed. Hmm. Well, anyway, I, I saw Ted and gave him the stuff and he got away to California okay. I, I thought I had a hunch that if this was a gag, Ted might have had a hand in it. So I made a few cracks, but he didn't give it a tumble, you know, like he would if he'd had anything to do with it. <laughs> he can go just so far with a gag and then he can't keep his face straight. But he, he didn't fall for any of my hints at all. So, uh, man, I gotta forget it. But just for laughs, when I see that Al April, I'm gonna make him show me that sound effects pistol. <laughs> Believe me. So then I went and did my commercial. The guy from the agency was there. He had the renewal of my contract with him, so... Well, anyway, after I signed it and, and he signed it, I'm not going to hold auditions for my job tomorrow. So, like they say on the radio, here we are at the bottom of the well. This is no dream. This is the hallway that goes down to Studio 15. And there's Miss Rose. Hello, Miss Rose. Through the door. There's the drinking fountain on the left. And the lights are turned on. It's bright. Yeah, I'm early today. I'm going to be here early so I can talk to Al April and look at that sound effects gun. I'm not dreaming now. Cut it. Studio 15. In the door. In the control room. Nobody there. Where it always was. And the light 
Go on. Yeah, All right. Don't be here yet. You all right, Johnny? Oh. I'm not either. Look at the clock. Oh. Who are you? I'm Mr. D. I got your note and I came right over. Note? What note? The note you wrote me to meet you here tonight. Oh, I didn't write any note. Why, you certainly did. I've got it right here in my briefcase. Well, I've got it right here. I don't know what you're talking about, mister. Now, just a second. Oh, my goodness, I don't seem to have it after all. But I'm here, so that's all that matters, isn't it? What did you say your name is? D. Well, what'd you want? I'm, I'm on the air just a little while. Oh, no, it I... won't take long, Johnny. I've got the catalog right here. And uh, you can pick one out in no time. Uh, about how high do you want to go? What did you say your name is again? D. Ah, here's the catalog. How do you spell it? Spell what? Your name. Oh, a D E A T H. Uh, shall we sit down here at the table where I can spread out the catalog? This is Mr. Deeth, or whatever your name is. This gag has gone just about far enough. Why, what gag, Johnny? Your gag. My friend's gag. I'm tired of it. Suppose you scram. What are you talking about, Johnny? I don't indulge in gags. Not in my business. And what is your business, Mr. Death, pronounced Deep? I don't know whether you're trying some of your radio humor on me, John H. You drag me all the way down from the Bronx to let you pick out a coffin. A coffin? You think I'm in the grocery business? Listen, I... Now, this one here, you wouldn't want. Man as well-known and uh, prosperous as you, John H., you, you wouldn't want to be found dead in this one. <laughs> no, sir, you wouldn't be found dead in it. Eh? Look, Buster, I don't want a coffin. Ah, then why did you sign an order for one and pay a substantial down payment? I didn't. All right, all right. Now, let's get this settled. Uh, now, this model, uh, 23, code name Tired. This will set you back, uh, 441, uh, 23 cents. Tax included, of course. I don't want it. Uh, something a little more expensive, perhaps, eh? Ah, here's a dandy. Code name Sleepy. Solid rosewood. Well, practically solid. Hand polished silver alloy handles, nylon lining in your choice of color. I don't want it. Okay. Okay. Ah. Well, what do you know about this for a coincidence? Huh? By George, I didn't know this model was in the book. Look at that. What? Look at the code name. Code name? John H. Man, is that a job. You know, I haven't seen this model yet. Look how it's streamlined. Plastics, too. The latest thing. Real built-in factory engineer dependability. Finest model we've ever made. And look, it's fireproof. And that coincidence about the code name, the, uh, the, the John H., uh, uh, you know what, John H., you'll be the very first user of this latest model. Stand up. What for? My goodness, this is a made-to-measure job, John H. Nothing too good for you famous radio people. <laughs> Stand right up there. That's it. Now, let me see. Uh, dimension A. <clears throat> My, you have broad shoulders, don't you? Now, let me put this down. There. Listen, mister, please, I... I'm going to get it absolutely right, John H. I tell you, I can hardly wait to see you in it. Stand still. Listen, this has gone far enough. Just hold the tape, eh? Now, now, let me see. Uh, uh, three inches above your head. Now, uh, six feet four inches. Ah, I didn't realize you were that tall, John H. Uh, how much do you weigh? Well, let's see. Uh, I, I've lost 17 pounds since I went on the diet. My, my. You must tell me about that. If we have time. 17 pounds. Yes, huh? And that makes it... Uh, 190, uh, uh, one. Oh, my gracious, I can save you a little money then. The oversized models carry a 4% discount, you see. 
Little ones are harder to make. You're very fortunate, John H. Now, huh? as a plaque on the lid. Uh, see here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can engrave that with any large emblem or, uh, you know. Are you an odd fellow or a moose or anything like that? <laughs> you are a big fellow, and I suppose you could say in slang that you're a big moose. <laughs> Get it? No. The only thing I belong to is the lambs. Lambs? Lambs. Oh, my, John H., I, I really don't think we could do that. Uh, you see, we uh, carry all the well-known emblems in stock, but uh, the lambs, we'd uh, have to have that engraved, and I'm terribly afraid there won't be time. Huh? Oh, you said it was a rush job, remember? Matter of fact, it's tonight, isn't it? What's tonight? When you ought to be killed. If I remember correctly, you uh, said in your note with the order that a sound effects pistol was... Mr. Uh, D. Did, did I write that? Well, I couldn't swear to it in court, of course, John H., but somebody wrote it, and your name was signed to it. Well, look. I'll write my name. Uh, is that the signature? Absolutely identical, John H. Yes, sir, absolutely identical. <laughs> I remember the curly cues on the H. I don't understand. It's perfectly simple. You're going to die, and you need a respectable, refined, late model coffin. That's all. Uh, are you sure I'm going to die? Cheer up, John H. Of course you're going to. You know, I, I, I heard that before. Yeah, it's all over town. Tonight. That's what you said. By a, by a shot from a, a sound effects pistol. I saw it in your own handwriting. How did I... No, Mr. D. No, I'm sure I don't know, Johnny. Is, isn't there any way out of it? Uh, don't ask me. I'm just a salesman. And you're just a customer. Not that I don't enjoy listening to you on the radio, Johnny. I really do. And I must say that you're going to be a great loss to the uh, uh, art, science, pro profession. What, what, what do you call it? It's a living. A uh, living. And uh, now it's a dying <laughs> Mustn't mind my little jokes, John H. <laughs> I'm an inveterate joker. <laughs> is this one of your jokes? Oh, no, John H. This is strictly business. Now, uh, uh, did, did you want to give me a check for the remainder now? Well, I... I, I think possibly that'd be wisest, considering that, uh, well, you know how long it takes to get money out of an estate. Now, look, uh... What if I don't die? Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. Well, what if I don't? Well, you will eventually, John H., and uh, at least we'd have time to engrave anything you wanted on the plaque. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh... Oh, excuse me. Uh, is uh, this the gentleman that's going to shoot you? Huh? Oh. Hello, Al. Hi, John H. <laughs> well, you get killed again tonight. <laughs> I do, huh? Says here you do. Uh, how do I get killed this time, Al? Get shot. I see. Uh, excuse me, Mr. D. Certainly. Is he the one? He's the sound man. Al April. Uh huh? Uh huh? Very interesting. Uh, say, Al. Yeah? You, you ever have any accidents with those guns? <laughs> No. How could you? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what kind of accident? Really shooting somebody. With these things? Uh, no. Look, in the first place, they're loaded with blanks. In the second place, there ain't any place for the bullet to come out, if there was one. And in the third place, I always shoot them at the floor. So how could I shoot somebody? I... Mm -hmm. I was just wondering. You know, I always wondered how you do sound effects on the air. This is most interesting. Uh, this is Mr. Deeth, Al. Uh, how are you, Mr. Deeth? Your face looks familiar. You in radio? Oh, my, no. I'm a salesman. Oh. Can, can I look at the guns, Al? Sure. Which one are you going to use on the show? Uh, this one. See, what's the matter with you, John H.? 
I'm a little nervous, I guess, Al. Ah. <laughs> Thought you was on the wagon. <laughs> well, I am. I, I'm just a little nervous, I guess. Let's see the bullets. Uh, they're not bullets. Blanks. Well, the blanks. Oh, here. How do you load it? Ah, oh, give it to me. There. Uh, can I shoot it? Uh, sure. What do you want to shoot it for? Well, I... I got to make sure of something. John H. is sure he's going to be shot tonight. Yeah, that's right, Al. I, I just want to test out these shells. Well, that's silly because... Oh, go ahead. But don't point it at me. Oh, I thought you said you couldn't shoot anybody with it. Well, you know, the wadding. It stinks, kind of. You'd, you'd use these same shells on the show, huh? Well, sure. What you scared of? I just... I just... Uh... I got a hunch, Al. Well, those are the same shells I'll use on the show. Go ahead and shoot. I'm going to get set up. Okay, Al. You ask for it. Hey, don't point that gun at me. <laughs> Doggone it. Hey, I told you about that wadding. It stings. Doggone it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Al. You, you shot me. There. Mr. Date. Why, John H., you killed him. That's right. So I'm not going to die after all. Take your coffins and get out of here. Why, don't be silly, John H. Of course you're going to die. No, I am not. Why, certainly you are. You murdered poor Al in cold blood, and they'll send you to the electric chair. Yeah? <laughs> How are they going to do that? They won't have any witnesses except you. Why, and I... John H., how foolish. What about the people listening to you on the radio? Goodness, John H., don't you know you're on the air? Quiet Please story you have listened to is A Night to Forget. Willis Cooper writes and directs Quiet Please, and John H., the man who spoke to you, was Ernest Chappell. And James Monks played Mr. Deef. Al April was played by Murray Forbes. And the sound effects on the show were played by Al April. Others in the cast were Jack Tyler, Kermit Murdoch, Lon Clark, and Polly Cole. Original music for Quiet, Please, as usual, is played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here's our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Tonight's show is the 40th in the series of Quiet, Please. Next week, for the 41st, I think I'll call the show after the name of our series. Let's call it Quiet, Please. And so, until... Next week at the same time. And quiet, please. I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet, please, comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Three.
Practically, nobody is named Sebastian. And I have taken in my lifetime a good deal of kidding about my name. Well, Sebastian is an unusual name, and a, a great many amateur humorists seem to enjoy working on it. And when Evelyn Waugh's Bright's Head Revisited came out, at least seven of my friends sent me huge teddy bears. If you should happen to need a teddy bear... I... Uh, but I didn't come here to talk about teddy bears. I thought maybe you might help me. At least I can tell you. May I? Well, it's kind of... Uh, I suppose you'd say it's an obsession. Well, on the other hand, I guess you have to have a thing quite a while before you could call it an obsession. This has only been bothering me since day before yesterday. So I suppose maybe we'd better call it a premonition. I was walking down the street, and there was absolutely nobody near me. And a voice spoke to me, right in my ear. A very quiet little voice. It just said one word. Three. Did you hear it? You must have heard it. What was it? I tell you, there wasn't anybody near me. There, there wasn't anybody within a block of me. Well, I thought then I was, you know, hearing things. You know how it is. You, you think you hear your name called or something, and it's just some kind of subconscious thought that jars its way into whatever you're thinking of, and... Well, maybe it isn't any of me. Maybe somebody does call your name somewhere. Well, I don't know. I... I suppose I might have forgotten it, except for one thing. I walked on down to the office and I went into the lobby. I stood in front of the elevator. The door opened finally. I got in. Another man got in behind me. He stood right in front of the door in the middle of the car. The operator started to close the door, and the other man spoke. Three. And it suddenly came. It was the same voice. And I was suddenly seized with the most dreadful fear I've ever known. I scrambled past the man as the doors drew together. Hey, look out, mister. What do you think? Let me out. Let me out. Well, for Pete's sake, make up your mind, will you? I stood chanting in the corridor, watching the indicator above the door as the car went up. Two. Three. We haven't found out yet what caused it. Apparently, though, the operator, who was a new man, mishandled the controls at the third floor, and the car dropped down to the sub-basement. No way of telling, of course, because the operator was killed. We think we're fortunate, however, that there was nobody else in the car. Did you hear that? There was nobody else in the car. Well? What about the man who said three? No. Nothing more happened that first day. I walked upstairs to my office, and I stayed there. I didn't do very well on the job that day. Oh, yes, I forgot something did happen. No, nothing like the elevator thing. It was just the telephone. It rang three times. At three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, I know there's nothing unusual about a telephone ringing three times, only this one. I picked up the receiver when it rang the first time... And it rang two more times. Telephones don't do that. That was all the first day. I went home very carefully. I remember I waited at the corner very conscientiously and until the number three bus went past. I'll never ride a number three bus again. I'll walk the extra four blocks and ride the number twelve. I was pretty conscious of that number. I saw threes everywhere. Three men in the restaurant. I began looking for threes. Three, three letters in my mailbox. Oh, I found threes everywhere. Three pennies fell out of my trousers' pocket when I was undressing. Three of those black wartime ones made out of zinc or something. They don't seem any new these. They, they look somehow sinister lying there on the bedspread. Three black pennies... And all of a sudden, I remembered. I used to put pennies on dead men's eyes. But then I thought, well, there's, there's three of them. 
I haven't got three eyes. And you know what? I said to myself, I wonder. I wonder if maybe I, I have got three eyes. And I walked over to the mirror and looked. No. No, I haven't got three eyes. But you see what a thing like this can do to you? Well, that settled it. I went in the bathroom and I took down the pills and I took three of them. And I remembered just as I was drifting off that three pills are enough to put a man to sleep permanently. But I couldn't do a thing about it then. Oh, no, no. I, I didn't go to sleep permanently. I woke up. You guess what time. I didn't sleep anymore. I sat up and smoked cigarettes. When it was daylight at last, I dressed and went out. First, though, I counted the cigarette butts. I'd smoked one whole package and 13 besides. You can count it up. And the street was deserted early in the morning. I walked past the movie house. The sign on the marquee said, Last three days. I went down to the office. Walked all the way. I walked upstairs. This was only 7 o'clock in the morning, right, Jeff? I unlocked the door. And there were three men in my office. At 7 o'clock in the morning. I just... I just stood there and looked at them. Good morning, Sebastian. Who are you? My name is Lee, Sebastian. Well, what are you doing in my office at this time of the day? Sebastian, this is Mr. Dix. Good morning, Sebastian. I said, what are you doing in my office? And this is Mr. Gay, Sebastian. Did you hear me? What are you doing here? Please, Sebastian. Will you answer me, or do I have to call an officer? I think we'll put the desk over here, Dick. I'd like it better along this wall, Lee. You'll have to have a new rug and new draperies. Listen, you three. Certainly, Sebastian. What is it, Sebastian? Speak up, Sebastian. I want to know what you're doing in my office. Oh, that. Don't mind us. <laughs> of course not. Now, about the filing cases, Lee. I don't want them. Do you, Gay? I'm sure I don't. What are you doing here? Do you hear me? Why, Sebastian, we're just looking it over, deciding on the changes. We uh, don't like it this way. And what business is it of yours? What are you going we're to... We're going to move in here. You what? When you leave. What are you talking about? I'm not going to leave. Yes, you are. I am not. Certainly you are, Sebastian. Are you people crazy? Why, no, Sebastian. Are you? Oh, I... I don't know what you're talking about, and I... Sebastian, come here. Over here, by the window. Come on. No, you're not going to get me to that window. I know what you're up to. I'm going to get a policeman. Oh, no, Sebastian. You're wrong. We're not going to push you out. I should say you're not. We don't have to. Of course not. Just look, Sebastian. I looked out the window. And right below me was the sign on the movie house I told you about. Big red letters, they said. Last three days. But I hadn't noticed before. Or maybe it wasn't there before. The three had a big red X across it. And there was a two painted on top of it. And when my eyes had focused again, I turned around. There wasn't anybody in the room but me. That's right. The door was closed, and there's only one door. The only thing that was different from the way I'd left it yesterday was the calendar pad on my desk. And there were just three pages left on it. And the top one had a big red X crawled across it. I never took a drink in my life before five o'clock. I seldom touch the stuff, but I well, I do keep a bottle in my desk for an occasional client who likes a nip in the daytime. I took two nips. And I got very brave and very matter-of-fact when I found the second one. 
Well, after the third one, I, I went out in the hall and I walked downstairs. The elevator starter was just coming to work. He looked at me with a very strange expression when the whiskey and I spoke to him in a loud voice about three strange men invading an office at seven in the morning. And then he asked me, more or less politely, to describe him. Do you know, I couldn't remember a single thing about any one of the three. He looked at me as if I were crazy. And I remembered what Dix had said. No, we're not crazy, Sebastian. Are you? I don't know. Maybe I am. A man can't be haunted by a number, can he? Or can he? You remember what I told you about being careful about the number three bus? Well, a number three bus ran into a light stander last night and caught on fire. No, only only one man was killed. I saw his picture in the paper. I thought there was something familiar about his face. And then it came to me. I walked over to the mirror above the washstand in the corner. Why, the man looked enough like me to be my twin brother. Ought to be me, for that matter. What is this thing? So, so then I sat down at the desk and, and I thought some more. Maybe, maybe I've been working too hard. Maybe, well, anyway, i got to do something about it. Yeah, but what? I'll call up Dr. Mandel, I say to myself. Dr. Dr. Mandel can tell me if I'm going crazy or what. Give me the phone. Well, let's see. What's his number? Uh, 4087. Is this Dr. Mandel's office? Oh, my, no, sir. Is this 4087? This is the beverage funeral parlor, sir. The what? The undertaker, sir. Isn't this 4087? No, sir. This is 3333. How did I get that number? Well, I couldn't miss it that much. 4 0 8 Seven. Good morning. May we be of service to you? Who is this? You dial three 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 three, sir. This is the beverage funeral parlor. I'm sorry. I, I can't be that drunk. You're going to be. Where's that bottle? This is the telephone company. Look here. There's an insane man who keeps dialing this number and telling me it's the wrong one. Can't you put a stop to it? For three solid hours now, he's been ringing this number. And we have clients of our own to take care of. Well, I don't care what you do, but stop that man. No matter what I dialed, it always came out three, 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 three. I called Dr. Mandel. I called the police. I called my Uncle Hubert. And always there was that man with a fat voice wanting to be of service. Good morning. May we be of service to you? That was yesterday. Today. Oh, yes, I was for three this morning. There was somebody in my bed. No, no. I'm getting awfully tired of these things happening to me, too. But you should complain. It's not happening to you. All I want from you is a little sympathy. Or at least the chance to tell my story. Just tell my story. No, really, I'm sorry. This stuff is beginning to get me down. Beginning? It's got me. 
I don't know what's happening to me. Either somebody's trying to make me lose my mind and commit suicide or something, or... Or it's true. All I can hear is... Three. Three men. Three. Three days. And now there's only one day left. And the second leaf of my calendar pad had a big red X on it this morning. And everywhere I go, I... Things happen in threes. I hear streetcar gongs. I hear automobile horns. I hear knocks on doors. I hear noises in my head. And all of a sudden, I remember I heard on the radio that there's going to be a radio program tonight called Three. What are they doing to me? Help me, please. Do something. Please, please, please. Do you hear that? Do you hear the way I'm talking? Do you hear me? Sebastian. Look, I can't stand it any longer. I, I've got to do something. Well, it'll be it'll be three o'clock in just a little while, and I know that's going to be the deadline. Well, I know it. So do you know it, don't you? Who is it that hates me? Who is it that's going to get me? Is it you? All right. All right, I know what I'll do. I'm going in here. I'm going to have a drink. Uh, you stay out there, all three of you. I walk inside. The bartender is standing behind the bar. Hello, bartender. Hello, Sebastian. How did you know my name? Why, you told it to me. I did? When did I tell it to you? Why, last night. Last night? I wasn't here last night. Well, this morning, then. Why, I wasn't here. I've never been here before. <laughs> oh, now, Sebastian. You got a hangover? Oh, I don't remember. Why, sure, you was in here with them three men. What three men? You know, all the fellas with the funny names. Funny names? Yeah, you know, all three of them with the three-letter names. Dix? Sure. Dix, Lee, Gay. The three threes. <laughs> when was this, bartender? Oh, three o'clock this morning. <laughs> I'm trying to pull myself together. I try. I try hard. But my... My head is all mixed up. I'm getting scared, bartender. What you scared of, Sebastian? Three. Three? Just three. Oh, that reminds me. What? A fella telephoned just before you came in. Said he'd be here at three o'clock. <laughs> Coincidence, huh? Who? I didn't say. Said if you wanted to call him back, call him at three, 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 three. Yes. Yes. I know who he is. You want a drink? No. No, I guess not. No? Just talk to me, will you? Sure, Sebastian. Till three o'clock. What? Your friends will be here then. Oh, I'm scared. Why? Somebody's after me. That's so. What am I going to do? Well, I don't know anything you can do, Sebastian. Look, talk to me. Talk to me. Take my mind off it. What will I talk about? Anything. Anything except... Anything. Well, let's see. Talk. Talk, I'm scared. Well, let's see now. Well, uh, you take names. Names? Sure, like yours, for instance. Sebastian. <laughs> it's a very odd name. I think I've only seen it once before in my life. Where? On a gravestone somewhere. Don't talk like that. Well, it is an odd name. It's unusual. Names have got a lot of meaning. Yeah, yes. Mine means uh, to be reverenced, I think. Does it? <laughs> Ain't that odd now. Ain't it? You still scared? Talk some more. I'm talking. 
What time is it? A little before three. Talk! Well, I'm talking about names now. I got a funny name, too, for a bartender. You have? For a bartender. What is it? You are scared, ain't you? Why are you looking at me so funny? Well, it's pretty near three. Bartender, what's all this about three? Well, I was going to tell you a funny coincidence. Talk. Talk, please talk. Well, you're so worried about this three Talk, stuff. will you? Talk. Talk to me. Well, I, I was going to tell you about my name. Well, what is your name? Is it Joe or Tom or Harry or Charlie or Aloysius or Alcibiades or Mike or what? That's what's so funny. It's dry. Dry? Oh, that's, that's very funny. Oh, that's extremely funny. Oh, that's, that's funny, bartender. A bartender named Dry. <laughs> a, a dry bartender. <laughs> oh, well, sir, that, that sure is funny. <laughs> yeah, but of course, that ain't the way you spell it, see? What? No, oh, you see, it's a German name. Is it? Yeah, sure. Spelled D R E I. It means three, you know. No more three. No more bartender named Dry. What do you suppose it was? I'm, I'm never going to hear any more threes again, am I? Oh, oh yes, I am. You remember? When the judge says to be hanged by the neck until dead, dead, dead. You have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And others who played in tonight's story were Les Tremaine, Vinton Hayworth, Cameron Proudhon, and Kermit Murdoch. Music for Quiet, Please, as usual, is composed and played by Gene Parasso. Now, for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Next week, our story is about a man who couldn't escape his fate. It's called Kill Me Again. And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>